This is a video describing how to carry out the first required practical in GCSE Physics or the Physics section of GCSE Combined Science. In this practical we calculate the specific heat capacity of a material such as a metal block or a beaker full of water. Before we look at the fine detail of the practical, let's remind ourselves what we mean by specific heat capacity. Capacity is a concept that you met in primary school and it's about the maximum amount of something that a container can hold. In physics, when we talk about heat capacity, we mean how much heat energy is transferred to a substance in order to raise the temperature. Using the word specific tells us that I'm not just talking about an object of any size and a temperature rise of any amount. What I'm interested in is the amount of energy that's required to heat up one kilogram of a substance by one degree C. The equation that links energy and specific heat capacity tells me that the change in energy, which of course is measured in joules, in other words, the amount of energy that I need to put in to heat up a substance, can be found by multiplying together the mass of that substance in kilograms, the specific heat capacity of that substance, which is in joules per kilogram per degree C, and also the temperature change in degrees C. Of course, that's not much use to us if what we want to do is use the energy change which we've measured to calculate the specific heat capacity. So we need to rearrange this equation into a slightly different format. We want the C term, which represents specific heat capacity, to be on its own. But right now it's multiplied by mass and multiplied by the change in temperature. So to get rid of those two terms which are currently multiplying, we need to do the inverse operation. In other words, divide. And whatever we do to the right hand side of the equation, we have to also do to the left. So we're left with a slightly new format of the same equation. Specific heat capacity can be found by taking the total energy change and dividing that by the mass of the substance multiplied by the change in temperature. So let's say we were asked to calculate the specific heat capacity of olive oil and we know that it takes 63,040 joules to raise the temperature of 0.8 kilograms of that oil from 25 degrees to 65 degrees. To start with, I don't have all of the terms from this equation. I don't actually have temperature change yet. So the first thing I need to do is to work out what that temperature change will be. 65 take 25 is 40 degrees C. So now I can substitute in my values. 63,040 must be the amount of energy because it has a J after it and that J stands for joules, which are the units for energy. So I'm going to do 63,040 divided by 0.8 times 40. In other words, 63,040 divided by 32. That gives me an answer of 1,970 joules per kilogram per degree C. Now onto the required practical, which asks us to determine the specific heat capacity of one or more materials by linking the work done to the increase in temperature and the thermal energy stored. To set up this required practical, I need a number of pieces of equipment. Firstly, I need the substance that I'm trying to work out the specific heat capacity of. In this instance, I'm using a metal block, although you may also have investigated the specific heat capacity of liquids, in which case you would have used a large beaker full of that liquid. Secondly, I have a balance in order to work out what the mass of my block is. It is possible to buy specific blocks that are exactly one kilogram for this purpose, but even then I should really be using a balance just to double check, because the whole point of specific heat capacity is that it refers to one kilogram. So if my block only weighed half a kilogram, I'd need to take that into account in my calculations. The third thing that I've got is some insulation to go around the outside of my block or my beaker. And this is because we want to minimise the amount of energy that's being lost to the environment around the block or the beaker, because we're going to assume that all of the energy that's been given to the block has actually gone into it and been used to raise its temperature. But if it's actually losing energy to the atmosphere, then our numbers are not going to be accurate. Of course, I need to be able to calculate what that temperature change is, and so I have a thermometer. And going with that, I have a pipette. The reason I have the pipette is that if I don't include a small amount of water in the gap, then because my thermometer doesn't fit perfectly into that hole, I'm going to have an air barrier between it and the metal, and so I won't get an accurate temperature reading. Next, I need a way of actually heating up my substance. So here I have a little immersion heating element. And then on the right hand side, I have three pieces of equipment, a voltmeter, an ammeter and a stop clock. 
Now it is possible to do this practical using a power pack and using something called a joule meter, which will just tell you directly how much energy is being transferred. Um, but this isn't the only way to do it, and lots of schools don't have joule meters. So although the maths is a little bit more complicated, we are going to look at how to do this using the voltmeter, ammeter and stop clock. If you've bought a metal block that's designed for measuring specific heat capacity, then it will probably have two pre-drilled holes, one for your heating element and one for your thermometer. And as we've already said, it's important to add a couple of drops of water to make sure that you're getting an accurate temperature reading. We also wrap the insulation around the block and then the heating element can be plugged into an electrical circuit. If you're very lucky, you might have access to a joule meter which tells you directly how much energy is being transferred from the power pack, but more likely you'll be using an ammeter to measure current and a voltmeter to measure potential difference. As you can see, the ammeter is in a single loop with your heating element and the voltmeter is connected in parallel on its own branch. Before we turn on the heating element, it's important to take an initial temperature reading using the thermometer. And then you can turn on your power pack and start the stop clock. Now the power pack will presumably be telling you that the, um, the power supply is at 12 volts or 10 volts, but even though it says that, you're going to use the voltmeter because that's going to give you a more accurate readout of how much energy is actually being transferred. Throughout the experiment, you'll take regular readings. We're only really interested in what the temperature change is at the very end of the practical, but by regularly writing down the current and the potential difference, we can take account of the fact that these might fluctuate from minute to minute. After a certain amount of time, maybe five minutes or 10 minutes, or you may judge it based on when the temperature has increased by a certain amount, you stop the clock and take a final temperature reading. So you get to the end of this practical, and now we need to use the numbers that you've written down to calculate the specific heat capacity. So let's say that I'd done this practical and I had a 0.5 kilogram block, and over the course of that experiment, the average reading on the ammeter had been two amps, and the average reading on the voltmeter had been 10 volts, and this experiment took me 10 minutes, and in that time, the temperature rose by 12 degrees C. Now you could be given several individual parts sort of question 1.1 and 1.2, or the exam board could just put this all together in one extended response question worth maybe four marks. So let's look at how we would carry out each step here. Firstly, I need to calculate the power for this setup that I have. So I know that power is found by multiplying current by potential difference. My current is the number with an A after it, the number in amps. And my potential difference has a V after it for volts. And so that gives me an answer of 20 watts. In other words, every second that goes by, 20 joules of energy are being transferred. Now I can use energy is power times time in order to work out how much energy was transferred in total, because it's no good knowing that 20 joules are transferred every second if actually my heat is on for more than one second. So I've just worked out the power up here. So I've got 20 watts. And then my time, as we've kind of just hinted at, needs to be in seconds. So I'm going to take that 10 minutes and multiply it by 60 to make it 600 seconds. And that gives me um, a total energy transfer of 12,000 joules. And of course it's in joules because it's energy. And then finally, I'm going to use my specific heat capacity um, equation to work out what the specific heat capacity is. So I'm gonna to need to rearrange this as we did before. So specific heat capacity is the change in energy divided by the mass multiplied by the change in temperature. So I've just worked out that the energy was 12,000 joules and I'm dividing that by my mass, which was 0.5 kilograms, uh, multiplied by my temperature change, which was 12. And that's going to give me an answer of 2,000 joules per kilogram degree C. You may look at that final answer of 2000 and think, well, isn't that a little bit high for a metal block? And you'd be right. And this is a really common exam question that comes up year after year. Some students did this experiment. They calculated that the specific heat capacity was 2000. And then they looked up the actual answer in a data book and it was only 800. How could they be so inaccurate? Well, the answer is that the students have assumed that all 12,000 joules of energy that were transferred by that power pack have made it into the metal block and are heating it up. And that's simply not accurate. 
You saw when we set up the experiment that we added insulation and that was there to minimise energy losses to the environment, but it's not going to completely stop them. You saw that my metal block didn't have any insulation on the top of it at all, so it's going to lose a huge amount of heat energy that way. And it's just not possible for us to prevent heat losses to the environment. The second thing is that the heating element itself may not have perfect thermal conductivity. In fact, it won't have perfect thermal conductivity. So it's going to take a little while for any energy that gets into it to get into the metal block. And this is going to be even worse if we're looking at the specific heat capacity of a liquid. So it's really important when you're looking at a liquid that you make sure that your heating element is not just sort of poking out the top of the liquid like this, because if it does, then we're going to have energy being lost to the sides straight away. And it's also going to be the case that this heating element is not going to be equally heating all parts of the liquid. So the liquid over here and the liquid here are going to be at different temperatures. And that's going to be a problem if my liquid here is getting really nice and warm, but it's my liquid here that I'm taking the temperature of. So the other thing we need to be aware of is the thermometer. And the fact that there will always be a little time delay between the block heating up and the thermometer reporting that. And so particularly if we're looking at a liquid, it's going to be important to stir that liquid to make sure that as far as possible it's homogenised and the temperature is the same everywhere. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you found that a useful introduction to the first physics required practical. If you did find this useful, then don't forget to check out the specific heat capacity calculations video and also like and subscribe for more GCSE physics content coming soon.